Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Terry Mulcair of the English Department here at SRJC, and I'd like to welcome you to this fall's final event in the Arts and Lectures series and the final event in the English Department's uh, fall 2019 Work of Literary Merit series, which has been devoted to Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Our guest today is Professor Mitchell Breitweiser of the English Department at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Breitweiser also holds the title of the Daniel E. Koshland Jr. Chancellor's Distinguished Chair in Writing. The title of his talk is Making Walden, How Thoreau Went About It. Back in the early 1980s, I had the good fortune to encounter Mitch near the beginning of my graduate studies at Berkeley. From his class in early American literature, I learned a lot of what I know about that topic, and I recall his class and his book on Mary Rowlandson's 17th century captivity narrative every time I teach our department's introduction to early American lit, as I am again this fall. Uh, back then, Mitch also generously agreed to sit in with a reading group that some Americanist grad students had formed. And I remember a couple of key lessons from our conversations with Mitch and that group. One was that we could pay the same kind of critical attention to the arts and popular culture, movies, music, and television, and so on, that we paid to classic works of literature and reap rewards of similar richness and value from that inquiry. The other thing I remember is that Mitch found a lot of things funny in both classic literature and popular culture and was not constrained in laughing freely at or with those things. Having an accomplished and distinguished role model laughing freely and happily at what ought to be laughed at is something I am enduringly grateful for. Professor Breitweiser has recently completed the manuscript, as I understand it, of his latest book, which is all about Thoreau and Walden. Its working title is Walden and the Spirit of Capitalism, Presence, Damage, and Cultural Revival. That covers a lot of important and fascinating ground, and I look forward eagerly to reading it and to hearing what Mitch has to say today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Breitweiser. So um, I do have a handout, and I think most of you probably have one by now, but um, if you don't, come down and pick one up so you'll know what I'm talking about down here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I must confess a little bit nervous, um, partly because I've known a number of the members of the SRJC English Department over the years from my work at Cal, Jennifer Royal, Carmen Castillo, Mark Boyanowski, whom I thought I saw in the back row there, and he was usually in the back row when he was in my classes as well, uh, and uh, Lori Kuwabara. Um, I also know about SRJC students from those who have transferred to Berkeley and been in my classes. Uh, it's been quite common when I've been speaking with a student who seems particularly intellectually avid and vigorous and interested in what I'm talking about, that when that student says to me, I'm a transfer student, and I ask, from where have you transferred? He or she will say SRJC. Um, so the quality of the English department here shows in the students who come to Cal. And I would mention, if she's the professor of any of you, that Professor Castillo is in that category, both someone who came there from SRJC and then came back here to be a member of the faculty. So one of the things I know about um, the English department here is that there's a very strong commitment to the teaching of writing. And in fact, it has seemed to me to be perhaps the core commitment of the SRJC English department. Um, Can you stand a little closer to the podium for the light from the screen? It's making it really difficult to see you. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, is this better? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, and. Um, I know about this because of conversations I've had with these faculty members I've mentioned before. So I've been thinking about the teaching of writing, um, and it was on my mind when I was planning out this talk. So as you may have noticed from the description, what I'll be talking about is Thoreau writing Walden. Um, this is, or as I put it, making Walden. Um, this is a particularly interesting topic to me. Uh, it probably wouldn't have been at your age, 
Uh, I'll try to make it interesting, but I ask you to bear with me. It's actually quite exciting now, so if I get start to hyperventilate, maybe Terry can pat me on the shoulder and calm me down. Um, the title, Making Walden, isn't really original with me. It comes from a book from 1957 by a professor named J. Lyndon uh, Stanley, Shandley, who taught at Northwestern University. Uh, and Shanley was very interested in Walden, um, but he had vaguely heard that the story of writing Walden was itself a very compelling story, uh, as well as the story that's told in Walden. So he set himself to figure out the story of writing Walden. Um, it was known that the handwritten manuscript pages of the book, Thoreau's handwritten manuscript pages of the book, were residing in a private library in Southern California called the Huntington Library. And various people had gone and looked at this pile of paper and described it in various ways and basically kind of given up in confusion trying to make sense of it. So Shanley decided he would try and puzzle out and see what he could learn about how Thoreau went about this. He knew that Thoreau had begun writing the book while he was at the pond uh, in 1846. If you look at the handout, right after that first paragraph, there's a couple of dates. Um, Thoreau was born in 1817, died in 1862. He lived at the pond from July 4th, 1845 to September 6th, 1847. And Walden was published in 1854. So what that means is we think he started probably in late September 1846, and the book was finished eight years later. So it's a, the rare book that takes this long to write, and Shanley thought there might be a story between, behind that. Previously, it had been thought that Thoreau sort of started out and wrote a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and did that for eight years. But Shanley thought that probably wasn't the story, was that there was a much more interesting, volatile, complicated history to this that in some sense Thoreau had wrestled with writing this book rather than smoothly composing it in sequential order. Shanley picked for the title of his book, The Making of Walden, because what he came to conclude was that Thoreau had assembled Walden. Um, making of Walden is an interesting word as opposed to say composing Walden or writing Walden. When we think of making as a verb, we think of taking components or parts and assembling them and making something out of them. And that word seemed to Shanley particularly useful to talk about this process of, of, of how Thoreau went about it. So Shanley was um, what we call a textual scholar. That is that he studies texts and how they were made and uh, works to make sure that the one that gets published is the one that's closest to the handwritten original. Um, and these scholars, of which I'm not one, have various skills. And one of the skills they have is studying things like types of paper, um, the handwriting style of a writer, um, and using these things to date things that they write. For example, many of you will have heard of the American poet Emily Dickinson. How many? Dickinson? Okay. So Dickinson wrote about 1,700 poems. And in her case, they were jumbled together until a scholar named Thomas Johnson sat down with them and he began to notice that there were several different kinds of paper in terms of the weight of the paper and the, paper mark, the watermark on the paper. And he began to notice that there were different handwriting styles on these as well. Um, there were no dates on these poems. So what Johnson did was he went to letters that Emily Dickinson had written over the years that did have dates on them, identified the handwriting style, say for 1864, and then found poems that seemed to be in that handwriting style. And in general, the poems that looked like they were in a common handwriting style were also on a similar kind of paper, which she seems to have been buying at that time. So by this method, we can roughly assemble Dickinson's poems in chronological order and know when they came out. And this is extremely useful to scholars such as myself uh, who interpret literary works. So I can ask the question, how is the kind of poem that Emily Dickinson was writing in 1863 different from the kind of poem that she was writing in 1867? The 1863 poems are more violent in their imagery, more angry, whereas there's a more reconciled, even kind of mystical tone to the later poems. 
once the dating was done, we also learned that Dickinson was writing about a poem a day during the Civil War and much less frequently after the Civil War. So you can see we can begin to come up with ideas about the composition of these poems. The fact that, that even though the poems aren't about the war, the fact that the kind of tension of a time of war might have played a role in poems that are about her personal life is an argument that we can begin to at least speculate about thanks to the work of textual scholars. So, so we can learn a lot about, at least speculatively, what was going on, not just in, in a writer's life in terms of was her father still alive, et cetera, et cetera, but what kind of writing was she doing at any given time? So when Shanley came to this pile at the Huntington Library, he counted about 1,200 pieces of paper, uh, which is a lot more than you would need to write a book of the length of Walden, but Thoreau wrote in pretty big letters and he didn't put a lot on a, on a piece of paper. So, so it isn't totally improbable that this would be all of the manuscript of Walden. Um, it had come to the Huntington through various hands. His sister had it after he died and she gave it to someone who gave it to someone who sold it, et cetera. It had gone through about five sets of owners before it came to land in the Huntington. And there are up to 20 or 25 sheets that exist elsewhere that somehow someone took one as a souvenir or whatever. But most of it's there at the Huntington. <coughs> and what, what Shanley did, <coughs> pardon me, was he began to sort after the manner that I've just described that Johnson did with Dickinson's poems. Handwriting style, paper style, color of paper in the case of Walden. And what he came up with was one group of about 600 pages, <coughs> excuse me, with a consistent handwriting style, consistent style of paper. And this was a draft of Walden. All the chapters were there from economy up through spring and conclusion. The titles were there. There's a table of contents there. So it looked like a complete draft of Walden. So he put those on the side and looked through them. And what he realized was it is sort of a complete draft of Walden, but there's a lot in that first set that isn't in the book that we've read. So what he realized was that, what, that Thoreau had done a pretty quick version of it that was more or less complete. He conceptualized all the chapters, etc., where to begin with, and then thought he was more or less done. And for some reason, he didn't stop there. But for the next couple of times, next couple of years, he went back and started adding, changing some words, which he would cross things out, and then adding in new paragraphs and so on. Um, for up until about 1849. Um, so if you look at this first chart on your handout, you'll see that Shanley had identified basically three versions of Walden. The first time through, then the second time through, he changes words, adds a few things in, third time through, does the same thing. Just like when you're revising a paper uh, for your class. But then he stops in 1849. And there's nothing that's new until 1852. And then we get an 1852 version with new things added in. Um, in 1852 and three, we don't know exactly when, but in the winter of that year, 1854, and then the very last one in, also in 1850 before, before he got it done. So what Shanley realized was there was this first burst of the book. Then for some reason, he quit or stopped or gave it up. He put it on the shelf and then later he went back to it. So now we have this really, really interesting literary mystery. How does it happen that a person could work that hard to put together that first version, the one that came after the first three, then get tired of it, get dissatisfied of it, we don't know, but then come back to it. And when he came back to it, he made major additions. He didn't make a lot of changes to what he'd done before, but there were really major additions. And the kind of things that he added in were extremely different. Sometimes it feels to me as if they were by a different person. 
The first edition is, are most of you now reading some of Walden in your classes? How many of you, would you, would you raise your hands? Okay, good, thanks. So I imagine you've probably read things from the beginning, like why do you need new clothes all the time? Or why do you have to wear what everybody else is wearing? Why do you need this kind of a house? Why do you need to eat this kind of food? Why do you have to pay the tick for the ticket to take the railroad to Boston when you could walk there in the same amount of time it would take you if you didn't have to work to buy the ticket, et cetera. And he's constantly giving this, this advice about how to live your life better. And to me, a lot of that, that stuff, which I think you may have been talking about, is pretty interesting and pretty useful and has been of service to me in my own life in terms of doing things more simply and not getting into complicated, expensive, demanding, stressful things just because everybody else is doing it. And this is the, the Thoreau that we're, in general, as Americans, most familiar with. On the one hand, as I say, this is very useful, but on the other hand, it can be a little bit self-righteous. Right? That he can sound like, I've got everything all figured out, and here's how you should live your life, but I know you're not living this way because you're doing all the stupid things that I'm inveighing against. And he's really picky about it. At one point, he said in one of my favorite passages, when I lived in the cabin, I had three pieces of limestone on my desk. Presumably because he thought they were cool. I have a couple of stones and a couple of other things that I keep on my desk because I like the associations with them. But he then says, but it was too much work to dust them all the time, so I throw them out the window. At another point, he said, someone wanted to give me a, a mat put, to put on the step into the cabin, but that was too much work, too, so I got rid of that. So you have a feeling that Thoreau sometimes has this kind of stripped-down existence, and that he takes enormous pleasure in giving up the things that other people need. I have one quotation from an article that you might want to read um, at your leisure, it's on the, the second page, the reverse of these charts. It's from a woman named Catherine Schultz. Uh, this is available online. This is an incredibly controversial essay. My students get really exercised about it. Uh, it's entitled Pond of Scum, Henry David Thoreau's Moral Myopia. And um, Schultz describes this Thoreau, who's always telling us how we ought to lead our life. The real Thoreau was, in the, has everybody got it now? Catherine Schultz in the middle of this reverse here. In the fullest sense of the word, self-obsessed, narcissistic, fanatical about self-control, adamant that he required nothing beyond himself to understand and thrive in the world. From that inward fixation flowed a social and political vision that is deeply unsettling. It is true that Thoreau was an excellent naturalist and an eloquent and prescient voice for the preservation of wild places. This is... Um, what your writing teachers tell you, conceding the opposite point of view. So I'm going to be open-minded here, Schultz is saying, for a moment before I go back to digging his grave. Um, but Walden is less a cornerstone work of environmental literature than the original cabin porn, by which he means sort of kind of like the gratuitousness of, of living in a cabin as a kind of pornography to read about. A fantasy about rustic life divorced from the reality of living in the woods and especially a fantasy about escaping the entanglements and responsibilities of living among other people. Thoreau lays out a program of abstinence so thoroughgoing as to make the Dalai Lama look like a Kardashian. <laughs> so when my students read this, they start out becoming really irate because they find Thoreau heroic, but eventually they end up conceding that there's some truth to this. Um, and Schultz, I think, has kind of overwritten it in order to be controversial. But there is truth to what she says. But what I've shown my students is that the parts of Walden that she's referring to, the passages that she discusses, come from this first group of drafts from the late 1840s. And that if we look at what he added from 1852 on, there's very little that has that tone of finger-shaking hectoring that he does. The later Thoreau is much more mystical. He's overwhelmed by his engagements with nature. And he has a kind of a, 
flowing and elastic openness as a person, as opposed to that tight, censorious, judgmental attitude of the early part of the book. So we can kind of see how he got to someplace else. But we still have the mystery of why did he come back to this book? in the 1850s. What had happened or what had changed? So let me give you a little bit of context about Thoreau's life and his um, personal history and his place in history. First of all, um, when he went to the pond, he was deeply emotionally disturbed about his life and about his family and about his friends. He'd been out of college for about five or six years. He'd done a little bit of publishing, but not that got any money for him. Um, he had, along with his brother, started a private school that didn't really succeed anywhere. He didn't really seem to have much going for him, except he was a genius at inventing new ways of making pencils. His father had a small pencil factory in Concord, and Thoreau found a new way of mixing graphite for pencils that made for the best lead of any pencils made in North America at the time. Um, he found a way of l making a lead that could be liquefied and then hardened so you could drill a hole down the middle of the shaft of wood as we do now, rather than having to have two pieces of wood enclosing them on the pencil. And the Thoreau pencils were thought to be, as I say, the greatest in North America. So the people who taught ar art classes in Boston were always saying, give me the Thoreau pencils. So he seemed to have a pretty prominent future but he didn't find it all satisfying to work on pencils in the pencil factory. Later in his life, he worked as a surveyor, did a few other things. So he had miscellaneous sources of income, but they didn't really fulfill him. And he was adamant that he would only choose a life of doing something that fulfilled him. He loved this older brother of his, John, deeply, the one with whom he started the school. Um, the year before he moved, several months before he moved to the pond, his brother was shaving and nicked himself on the razor, uh, got lockjaw as an infection, and died of it within 10 days after that. Thoreau himself developed what they call hysterical Henry David Thoreau lockjaw, that his jaw locked for about three weeks, and they thought somehow he'd caught it, but it was a kind of a phenomenon of his unconscious, and he got better from it. Emerson, his friend, the philosopher, had a son that Thoreau deeply loved who died during the same period. So when he went to the pond, his life was a mess. He had no sense of direction. He was deeply riddled by grief and so on. And in fact, we have various letters from friends of his saying, you have to do something to change your life, to get yourself out of this funk that you're in, to get yourself back on your feet. The idea of a cabin by the pond wasn't originally his. Uh, he had a friend in college who had built a cabin um, on a nearby pond, and Thoreau had spent a couple months there with him before, so the idea was in his mind. And his friend, William Ellery Channing, said, why don't you go do that one? Why don't you go build a cabin, go live there by, this, by yourself, and get yourself straight out there? Um, Emerson owned a piece of land on the north side of the pond, which is where the cabin was built, and he said to Thoreau, you can do what you want there on two conditions. And one is you clear some land and grow some beans on it, so when you leave, other things can be grown there. And also when you leave, I get to keep the cabin. Um, and that's all. So Thoreau went and lived there. And living there really did, in a way, sort of allow him to go deep within himself and encounter these problems and encounter himself. And as a person, grow out of and emerge from the distress that he had fallen into at this time of his life. And as you grow older, many of you will have times of funk or times of distress in your life where you don't quite see what the way out will be. And this is really where Thoreau was. Now, when you read that first chapter of Walden, there's no mention of this. He doesn't say, I went and lived on the pond because I was deep in this kind of distress. He merely says, you know, as a way of living, because it didn't cost me much money, it was wise as opposed to what you're doing, etc. And he doesn't really tell us much about why he went there. In fact, you know, the, one of the great unanswered questions of Walden is about that first chapter. If you're so good at all this clean, abstinent living, as you say, as opposed to your neighbors, if you're so clear-headed and so wise, why did you have to go live at the pond? Why couldn't you just stay in town and do all of these things, like not needing to have a lot of new clothes and so on? 
What drove you out there? And this is what we don't find out from that first chapter. Now, the reason for that is that when Thoreau came back to town, he had solved a lot of his inner problems, but he hadn't solved the problem of what he was going to do for work. One of the ways you could make money in the United States, particularly in the Northeast in these years, was as a lecturer. That if you could lecture on topics that were of interest to people, you could go from town to town and make a fair bit of money. Emerson had a moderate inheritance from his first wife who had died, but he always needed money and he was a great lecturer, very charismatic, so he was touring a lot and bringing back a fair bit of money, so Thoreau thought, maybe I could be a lecturer. Others had thought the same. When Herman Melville, before he started writing his novels, when he first came back from his trip to the South Sea, started out as a lecturer too, and he bombed out, as more or less Thoreau did. He appears not to have been a charismatic lecturer, but he did give one lecture about living at the pond, why I went there, and what I did there. And that lecture, which we don't have anymore, but we have people talking about what they heard, is basically that first chapter. That, that first chapter where he talks about, you should live like I live, and here's what you don't know, you who live in town, etc., is an expanded version of that first chapter. And what lies behind it is the fact that he knew that he was facing an audience that was skeptical to adversarial, that thought that what he'd done was weird, misguided, self-indulgent, impractical, and so on. And that he elected to throw it back in their faces. You may remember if you read the first page of Walden, he said, there are these people who are asking these rude questions about me. And I'm writing this to explain the answers to those impertinent questions, he calls them. And that's why that first chapter is the way it is, that it preserves that rhetorical tone of being combative with the audience and explaining why he did based on the skepticism that he was facing. So, so he assumed what in literary studies we call a persona, and that is a mask that he used to project to his audience. And it's not a false one. He believed the things that he was saying, but it was only a small part of what he thought and felt. That it was really, this was a book that was going to be the reflection of a narrow or partial segment of what he felt as a person. Before he started Walden, he wrote a book which is quite beautiful, I love a lot, called A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. And it's a, it was after his brother had died and after he'd moved to the pond, but he's, it's a reminiscence of a boat trip he took with his brother. The two of them just got in a rowboat, went down the Concord River from Concord down towards the ocean. When they got to the Merrimack River, they turned left and went upstream into New Hampshire and then came back. It was a seven day boat trip, um, which basically it was a tour of New England and all that was going on in New England at the time. And it's a wonderful book, very beautiful, um, very moving in its descriptions of nature, um, sometimes a little boring in these little philosophical essays he puts in, but it's very different from Walden. But it's something that he had already written by the time he did this combative first chapter. So if you put the book, A Week on the Concord Merrimack, next to that first chapter, you can see how much of himself and of his feelings and of his spiritual life he couldn't put into that book Walden as he then conceived of it. This, it seems to me, and I'm not original in thinking this, is why eventually he burned out on that first version. Because it just didn't allow him enough room to express himself as a person. That it was only a sliver of whom he was that he al had allowed for in writing that book. So think of, for example, um, a friendship you have, which is based on the other person's appreciation of an aspect of your personality. And they really love that aspect of your personality. Um, so much so that your relationship be with them becomes you doing that with, with that person, that that's what you do. And it's gratifying that they like that and it, it makes for a strong attachment, but at a certain point you want for a relationship that allows for a larger expressiveness um, or a fuller articulation or expression of yourself. 
Um, and that's what I think was happening with Thoreau. But in 1849, he thought, that's a different book. But his heart went out of this one, and he began to think of, well, what kind of book do I want to write? So the next step is what was going on around Thoreau and Concord while he was writing. Um, and this is where the question of American capitalism becomes very important. In the wake of the, um, the 1812 war with Britain, um, the American economy got onto a firm foothold, began to grow rapidly. The West was beginning to open and the future prosperity, economic prosperity of the United States was beginning to come into view for people. And the way it showed up for people in Concord was that Boston was growing very rapidly because it was a port. So goods were coming from the West and going through the port, coming in through the port, et cetera. So more and more people were moving to Boston just as they were to New York in even greater numbers. So if you read Walt Whitman's poems, you'll know that they come from New York at this time with all these new people and new kinds of people and so on. So we have these kind of very, very new urban environments, very volatile, very demanding, exciting, but frightening at the same time. So Thoreau had gone to New York a couple times and to Boston several times, but he lived about 50 miles away in Concord. And when he was born, that 50 miles was an enormous distance. The roads were poor. In some places, the roads went through swamps where they had just laid down logs. Uh, so your cart kind of did this as it bumped over the logs. So going to Boston was a commitment. Um, you did it. It was probably easier on horseback than in a wagon. But commerce was not easy. Right? It, it, it was really costly and difficult to move any goods from Concord to Boston. But when Thoreau was young, not that many people wanted that many goods to come from um, Concord to Boston because the producers closer into Boston were enough because Boston wasn't that big. But as it grows, the radius of area within which they need products grows, particularly wood, which is what's used for fuel at this period. So there's a lot of deforestation around Boston. So they want conquered wood or wood from further out. They need to go farther away to feed the city. So first the roads are improved, but then three months before Thoreau moved to the pond, the railroad comes into Concord. And if you've been reading Walden, you know how frequently that railroad appears, but he doesn't really emphasize so much the fact how new it is. But think about it, on the pond, it was about a third of a mile away. So he moves out there and it's a fairly new thing. I'm not sure he quite knew what he was getting into, but four times a day, it goes by blasting its whistle really loud to tell Concord that it's about to arrive there. So four times a day, there's this humongous noise going on nearby, disturbing the tranquility of his life at the pond. And this is how he experiences capitalism as this, this large brute force which is coming into Concord. Some of you may have seen a movie that I loved when I was young, uh, The Blues Brothers. Have many people seen The Blues Brothers? One of the two Blues Brothers, I think it's Jake, lives in an apartment and right outside the apartment is the Chicago L train. And so the scene is hilarious as they're trying to talk and train after train goes by. And that always reminds me of Thoreau at the pond with this going on regularly. So if, if you do feel like as you read Walden that this is some kind of remote, isolated, quiet place, just keep thinking that four times a day that train goes by and reminds Thoreau of how the world is changing. Um, I'm seeing, by the way, that I'm not gonna be able to get to all the stuff that I put on the handout, but that's okay, you might enjoy reading it. So, so as Thoreau begins to think about it though, capitalism that is, it's not just the train, it's other things. It's the mindset of people in town who are getting more stingy, who are thinking more in terms of raising money rather than enhancing sociability. 
who are starting to have parties which aren't about being warm with their neighbors, but instead ostentatiously showing off the food and liquor that they're able to serve as a way of impressing by intimidating their neighbors. The more and more personalities are deteriorating in Thoreau's view as a result of this change. And also social life is beginning to deteriorate. Before this transformation, farmers used to get together and do things like raise barns together and cooperate on things, work in each other's fields, have festivals together during the harvest, etc. So even though the poverty was much greater in previous days before this new commerce came in, life was in Thoreau's view richer. Um, you may come across a passage in Walden where he said, um, when I was building my cabin, I had four of my friends come out and help me raise high the beams in it. And he said, I could have done it myself, but I did this for sociability. To someone in Thoreau's time, that would have been a reminder of the kind of thing that people did together with one another to help each other out in need, not that long before. So that little detail, which seems kind of innocuous to us, is Thoreau's way of telling us that things used to be different and better in recent memory. And one of the things that people have been remarking upon about Thoreau is that this, this acceleration in the transformation of rural capitalism happened at a very rapid pace in New England. In the equivalent in English architecture happened over the course of maybe 100 years. In around Concord, it was like 15 or so. He saw it in his own lifetime. It was as, as if you were watching this, could watch this transformation in, in fast motion. So we can assume a lot of people are really shocked, even though this isn't a city, which is so different. You may, for example, recall a character that he talks about named, uh, he doesn't give the name. His name was Alec Terrien. He was a, uh, um, from Quebec, and he was a wood chopper. And Thoreau says, you know, he'd walk to the woods and stop in my cabin when he chopping wood, et cetera, et cetera. And he mentions, he said, Terrien was trying to make him enough money to um, go back and build a house in Quebec. And again, it's just a small detail of the plot, but to a person who lived at the time, they would know that the reason Terrien had come there was that he could make so much more money chopping wood in Concord than he could in Quebec because of the Boston demand. So he could come back, make a lot of money, maybe or enough to go back and build a house in Quebec more quickly than he could if he just did the wood in Quebec. So here we have someone who's, in terms of language, religion, ethnicity, etc., is very different from Thoreau who didn't just happen to come down there, but has been drawn into the orbit of this new world which is coming into existence, which is bringing some interesting things to Thoreau's vicinity, like the wood chopper, but also some harsh things. Um, agriculture, for example, is being transformed from the many crops that were grown around Concord when Thoreau was a boy into a select few that are in heavy demand in Boston. So agriculture is becoming much more profit driven. And there's also a strong impulse to clear land and to drain swamps to make more arable land, that is land you can farm on, available. So physically, as you look around, it's a very different place. Socially, it's a different place. In conversations with people you talk to, there's these sort of more pinched, more profit driven people, but also, as he said, more desperate people who are trying to stay afloat in a very different kind of economy. And this is in the background um, of his thinking during this period after these original drafts. And he's thinking, well, what could possibly be done about this? Thoreau has been at times compared to Karl Marx as a person who analyzed how everything people's personalities, society, economy, religion, etc., was changing due to the onset of this new economic order. But Marx really had no patience with people like Thoreau. He just thought that they were people who just said, turned away from the world and, okay, I'm going to move out to the pond and ignore it and tend to my own spiritual life and really not notice what's going on in the world. Marx, you may have heard at one point, said that religion is the opiate of the people, meaning it's like when you go to church, 
you just go like to take a drug to make you forget about what's going on in the world rather than doing something to change the world. And oftentimes, Marxist thinkers who have taken an interest in Thoreau, though not quite in those harsh terms, will say that's basically right, that he really did a great job of analyzing what was going on, but his proposed change was kind of pathetic because it was just move to the pond and cultivate your own spiritual life. But during this period in the late 1840s, Thoreau was doing something different. He was beginning to think about other cultures that had gone before um, in the world. He had early on, before he moved to the pond, done quite a bit of reading in South Asian, that is Hindu wisdom literature, and had written about it a little bit, so that was in the back of his mind. He had taken an interest in Native American culture, uh, and that was in the back of his mind. And these things that were back there began to come to the front of his mind. Because as he looked to these cultures, he didn't see in the late 1840s what so many people did. And that was the simple, happy, innocent people who had lived these quiet and peaceful lives before the modern world came along. He didn't see that. Instead, he saw people who were quite mindful of the danger of what was happening in his own world and who had instituted various kinds of customs and practices to exercise some control over that. So, um, for example, he had read a book called The Institutes of Menu, which is a classic work of Hindu, Hindu spirituality, but inclines, it includes a lot of instructions about how to lead, lead your life. Um, it resembles perhaps uh, something like Leviticus or Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with those books, which are long lists of if you teach, touch someone with a skin disease, here's what you must do, here's how you must eat, etc., etc. But as Thoreau began to think about those books, he began to look at the portions where they talked about economy and about money. And he saw that they were all very mindful of the fact that the desire for monetary accumulation could very readily get out of control and could gain the upper hand, and that it was socially disastrous if it would be. So there were all sorts of regulations in Menu, for example, about how the making of money and the pursuit of a life of prosperity was decent, but that it had a kind of liability to disaster built into it that we need to be very wary of. Um, and this attracted Thoreau. As he thought about Native Americans, so it's sort of Indians and Indians. As he thought about Native Americans, he bemoaned the fact that there weren't many books by Native Americans um, or spiritual works by them. So he began to collect accounts of Native Americans from books written by Europeans who had encountered them um, and uh, to compile a sense of the cultural practices of the Native Americans. He called them as Indian notebooks. And by the time he died, he had 10 notebooks full of information about diet, dancing, economic life, uh, marital life, etc., etc., of the Native Americans. But he also put in things about Eskimos, about people from Greenland, about Polynesians. He was looking at everything he could gather about the world before capitalism to see what it had to offer by way of a kind of wisdom that might be of um, use to contemporary experience. How can we modernize these things? How can we update and upgrade these things in order to bring them into present use? So I've gotten to almost nothing on my outline here, but I've gotten to the point where I can say that, in my opinion, the thing that changed was this that Thoreau, in coming to this conclusion, found a way to expand Walden and to have the book do all kinds of things that he didn't originally thought it could do. You'll see examples of this in your handbook, uh, or your handout, and you'll also see some comments by various people about the transformation of Walden, the new Walden that begins to happen in 1852. And I apologize, we can't get to those, but I will just close with this remark that almost all the passages in Walden that concern the customs and practices of other cultures, 
monetary and otherwise, including sexual, dietary, etc. There are a fair number of them in Walden. With only one or two exceptions, they all come in in 1852. They weren't there before. That, that he comes back to life on his book based on this transformation in his thinking that allows him to think this book that he felt was kind of dead in the water instead has really enormous potential because he'd found a way to begin to address the problems that were on his mind when he began the book. And again, I apologize for not getting around to as much. We don't have much time, but we do have time for a couple of questions. If anyone would like to. Yes. Uh, in what single way do you think your studies on Walden have changed uh, the way you live your life? Pardon me? In what single way do you think your studies of uh, the creation of Walden and, and Walden itself have changed your life? How have my studies in Walden changed my life? Good question. Um, you know, I, when I first started to read Walden in high school, I didn't like it. I never got through it. I didn't get through it when I was an undergraduate, when I was your age. I got through it when I was in graduate school because I had to, because it was a requirement. And it's only over the years of teaching it that I've grown acquainted with it. So the answer to your question has more to do with my adult life than my young life. Um, but, but, you know, one of the, the major tenets of that first chapter is, he says, the, um, the cost of a thing is the expense of life that it requires. So it's not just how much you spend on it in terms of dollars, but how much do you stress about getting it? How much do you hope for it to do something for you and it fails to do it? How much do you stress about it once you've got it? How much do you feel crappy about yourself for having one? I mean, there's like a whole cloud of things that go around it in addition to the money that it costs you. And, um, the term that he uses there, the expense of life, like how much of your life do you spend on it? And behind that is the sense that we all don't have an infinite amount of life. He says in Walden, I didn't want to get to the end and feel as if I hadn't lived it. You know, I want to, in the, in the moment. So that's probably the part that's influenced me the most is like when I feel myself getting drawn into something, I think, well, how much is this really going to cost me? And not meaning dollars. You want to say more? Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, thanks, everybody. And again, oh, sorry. Uh, it's a two-part question. So okay. the, the huge acceleration and transformation in the economy that the growth is experiencing um, and the readability of the first chapter, I have a question about the relationship between those two things. The first is really a question for you. Do you feel like with the digital revolution we are in a similarly kind of disruptive uh, kind of radical acceleration that's having all sorts of disruptive social effects? And depending on your answer to that, what are the prospects for people who think to read Walden? When it has, this is my experience as a reader and a teacher too, it's very difficult the first chapter. It, it gets so much more convenient to read on and read through it. So I don't know if that question makes sense. Yeah, so Terry's question is, is our epoch, the digital epoch, in terms of its acceleration and strangeness, in my view, analogous to what I said about throws? And the answer to that is, I think, yes. I mean, in retrospect, we think, okay, so the railroad came to town. Now, how does that compare to the president doing 40 Twitters a day? But, but at the time, it was experienced as, you know, really undercutting. Marx has this saying, with capitalism, everything solid dissolves into air. And that's the way Thoreau felt, and I think that's the way we feel now a lot. So there is that analogy. And then the second part is, what about that first, first section, the difficulty of reading that first section? And um, what about that in the digital age? And there is a second chapter well, called Reading, where Thoreau contrasted reading what he considered great books from popular books. And popular books for him meant things like you would buy, say, at the grocery store when you're standing in line, that you can just sort of he actually swallows it to kind of gulping them down. And so, so it's a defense of slow reading, basically. What the fortunes are of that in our own age, I don't know. But, but there actually was a difference between he knew the difficulty of what he had written and the kind of easier reading that was being preferred at the time. I think we're out of time. <laughs>